Okay, well, why don't we get started? Thank you all very much for showing up tonight. And I uh, wanted to hear more about less invasive therapies for valvular heart disease and atrial fibrillation. I'm Matthew Sherwood. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at Fairfax Hospital. Um, I'm also uh, the co-director for our structural heart disease program, our cardiac cath lab, and our uh, LAAC Watchman program. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about several topics, but first, mostly about um, valvular heart disease. And your, your heart has four chambers and four subsequent valves that um, act as one-way flow kind of checks between the upper and lower chambers, and then between the lower chambers and the rest of the body, the lungs, and then all of the systemic circulation. The first thing we're going to talk about is the aortic valve, which has three leaflets and controls the flow of blood from the left ventricle in the heart, the main pumping chamber, out to all of the body, the brain, um, the other organs, your arms, your legs, etc. And a very common disease as uh, we get older is something called aortic stenosis, and that is a blockage of the aortic valve. What happens in most cases is that calcium and other things deposit on the valve and cause the valve not to open as well. So um, as we go, as I mentioned, the causes typically are calcium buildup in the elderly. However, another very frequent cause in approximately 2% of patients is a congenital problem. So you're born with an abnormal valve and it doesn't open as well and blocks flow. That creates a problem um, in the fifth or sixth decade of life. You can also have rheumatic fever. If you had that as a child, that can affect your aortic valve and your mitral valve. And that's common, less common now in the United States, but still more common uh, in places like South America and Africa. Finally, if you had cancer as a younger, as a child or as a younger adolescent, um, previous therapy for cancer was radiation to the chest. And that radiation, actually, what we find now, is can cause damage to the heart, damage to the heart blood vessels, as well as damage to our heart valves. And so we see some patients who have significant valvular heart disease from radiation, um, and they are candidates for uh, treatment for aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is a gradual process. So um, early on, ideally, the valve closes. It looks like kind of a... Um, sideways or upside down Mercedes-Benz sign uh, when it's closed and then when it opens you know there's a big triangular orifice in the center. As aortic stenosis progresses that orifice when it opens becomes smaller and smaller and as you see over in the severe uh, part of the slide the orifice is actually the same whether it's open or closed and that causes a major problem because it puts a lot of stress on your heart. What are the symptoms of having severe aortic stenosis? So when your aortic stenosis is mild or moderate, you often have no symptoms. You often don't feel any different. However, when it becomes severe, your heart starts to struggle against the blocked valve. And so you can experience shortness of breath or fatigue. You have difficulty walking um, short distances, lightheadedness, dizziness, even fainting. Um, you can even develop rapid fluttering or a rapid heartbeat or chest pain. Uh, and so those things should let us know in any case, whether it's your heart valve or another problem that you have, that something's wrong and you should visit your doctor to try to figure out what's causing your problem. So as our population ages, and I know you've heard over and over again, the baby boomer generation is aging and becoming kind of a very, very large um, part of our population here in the United States, this is, these are the patients that are at risk for aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is probably the second most common valvular heart condition. And what we know now is that when we're looking at the current decade in the 2000s, um, as many as 25 to 3% of patients have aortic stenosis. How serious is aortic stenosis? Well, once aortic stenosis or a blockage of the aortic valve becomes severe, and you start having those symptoms we just talked about, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, even fainting, then your lifespan goes down to about one to two years. And that's really scary. So once you start feeling those symptoms, you may only have one or two more years of, of life without being in the hospital all the time or perhaps without having a heart attack or having a stroke or unfortunately dying of heart failure. 
So this is an, an incredibly severe disease, and it's, it has a prognosis, if untreated, you know, like that of advanced cancer. So we should treat it very, very soon after we recognize that there are symptoms. Thankfully, unlike some of those really bad cancers, we have great treatments for aortic stenosis. About 10 years ago, what you would have to do, anybody who had severe aortic stenosis and symptoms would have to undergo open heart surgery to replace the aortic valve. A surgeon would go through the center of the chest, they'd open the heart, they'd cut out the old valve, and they'd replace it, they'd sew in a new one. Um, nowadays, we have a few more technologies that can help us. So medicine, there's no medications that can slow down the progression of aortic stenosis. There are medications that help to reduce the fluid in your body and to help you feel a little bit better with aortic stenosis, but nothing can slow aortic stenosis down. There's balloons we can use, but what we know, if you just use a balloon, that only lasts for about six months, and then the aortic stenosis comes back. So really what you need to do is replace the valve. As I mentioned, surgery, open heart surgery is an option, but the new option present for the last five to seven years in the United States is something called transcatheter aortic valve replacement, uh, and that is replacing the valve through a catheter that goes through your leg. So as I mentioned, surgical aortic valve replacement open heart surgery, cut open the center of your chest, you know, open the heart and cut out that valve. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement typically done through the femoral artery in the leg and then going up through the aorta, the main, um, aorta, main blood vessel in the body and putting the valve in that way. So what are the differences? Well, as you might imagine, open heart surgery, um, the disease valve is completely cut out and removed and you sew a new valve in, but when you have open heart surgery, you end up having to stay in the hospital for five to seven days at least. You end up being out of work or out of the activities that you normally would do for four to six weeks and sometimes two months. So that's, that's a long time to be rehabilitating and incapacitated because of a large surgery. The nice thing about transcatheter aortic valve replacement is you're only in the hospital for two or three days uh, and some of our patients actually get out of the hospital within one day. And your recovery time is typically only one to two weeks. So you usually feel about back to your normal activity within two weeks. So you can get back to walking, doing exercise, doing all of those things. Um, and so that offers our patients a lot of advantages as compared with open heart surgery. So we're talking about how TAVR is performed and, and I'm gonna show you an animation or a video and kind of walk you through that. Um, but basically we go usually through the large artery in the leg, we put a catheter up through that artery out into the heart and then we replace the valve either by ballooning open the artery with a valve on the balloon or we let the valve, it's a self-expanding valve and we let it expand into its natural position. Nowadays, more and more people, people are eligible for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So when it initially started, only those patients that couldn't have surgery could have transcatheter aortic valve replacement. But now we can, Patients who are intermediate or high risk for surgery can have it. And we're coming up to a point, early next year we'll have data presented about patients at low risk for surgery, which means that nearly everyone who has severe aortic stenosis would be a candidate to have transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And that's a major milestone um, for medicine in this country. Uh, because in Europe, that's the way most of the aortic valve replacements are done right now. So here's the animation and I'll kind of just walk you through it as we go. This is a balloon, it's being uh, put up through the femoral artery, up through the aorta, the main blood vessel, and through that valve that's as the heart is pumping. And then we pace the heart with a rapid wire, and we balloon open the valve. That makes space for the, the new transcatheter aortic valve replacement to be placed. So we take that balloon out, and then we put in the new valve. And the new valve is on a balloon and we put it up into the aorta. We mount the valve on the balloon to make sure that it's just right, make sure that it's gonna be in the right place and the right size. Once we get it in the exact right position, then we continue to place it up and around the aortic arch.
And we just, we get it right in the right place. We're very careful as we cross the aortic valve. We get it, we're very careful as we put it there. We're able to manipulate and alter exactly how the valve sits in that area to make sure that it's going to be implanted correctly. And then again, we use, and again, this is just showing that we can move it in and out, uh, side to side a little bit to make sure that we put it in just right. So then again, we get it positioned just exactly how we want it. And we do rapid pacing again, and we use a balloon, and we blow up the valve. This pushes the old valve out of the way. Now you have a brand new functioning valve inside that a metal cage. And we are able to extract. We take all of that apparatus out of your body. We take all the sheath and everything out of your leg and we repair it with a couple of sutures, percutaneous sutures, and what you're left with is a fully functional, uh, completely new aortic valve. And all this through a small incision in the leg rather than a large open heart incision. So it's, it's very exciting to us. It's recently been called one of the greatest medical innovations um, in the past 20 years. And so that's exciting that we get to provide our patients with a full valve replacement without putting them through open heart surgery. Um, as I mentioned before, the indication for this procedure is expanding. And so what we see is not only are we treating patients who are at lower and lower risk for open heart surgery, we can treat most patients, but also for patients who have had aortic valve replacement with um, a bovine or porcine aortic valve and that valve is failing, we can actually put a TAVR valve inside of that old valve. And so they don't need to undergo redo open heart surgery, we can actually do this procedure and save them um, another open heart surgery. And that's called valve and valve TAVR. It's for failing bioprosthetic valves. And so that's an exciting thing too. We see that in about 5% of our cases, patients who had a valve replacement maybe in their 60s or 70s, uh, they're now in their 80s and we can spare them an open heart surgery and actually put a brand new valve inside the old valve. In addition, there are plenty of places to find out more information about this. And, you know, it's become such an important part of American medicine that um, you can go almost anywhere on the Internet and find more information. But I'd urge you, if you have any questions or you have concerns about having um, heart valve disease, please call your physician, and we're happy to see you at ANOVA in the valve clinic. And we have a valve clinic specifically devoted uh, to patients with valvular heart disease where we can get you in to see an interventional cardiologist like myself and a uh, valve surgeon figure out what the best possible therapy for you would be. So now I'm going to move on to possibly something that's even more prevalent than aortic valve surgery and that is or aortic valve stenosis and that is mitral valve disease. The mitral valve the most prominent disease that happens to it is instead of getting blocked it often starts to leak. And that can happen uh, as patients age. It can also happen from patients with infection. Um, it can also happen congenitally. Uh, that is, patients are born with a valve that doesn't quite work as well. Kind of like uh, the story with aortic stenosis. The problem is that if the mitral valve starts to leak, it creates a problem for that bottom chamber, the main chamber of the heart, the ventricle, that uh, results in the heart failing. Eventually, it can't keep up with the fact that the mitral valve is leaking. It's supposed to be a one-way valve that keeps blood from going backward in the heart. And if it leaks, it's kind of like running the air conditioning in your car or your house with all the windows open. It means your heart is, is pushing really hard, trying to pump really hard, pump the blood in the right direction, and some of it is leaking backwards and not going where it should. So eventually that causes your heart to fail. This, as with aortic stenosis, commonly um, increases with age. and so moderate or severe mitral valve disease becomes more and more prominent as you get to the seventh and eighth decades of life. And as I mentioned before, unfortunately, it's a tough uh, and vicious cycle. That is, your mitral valve leaks, it causes your heart to work harder, the heart you know, keeps on working, etc., starts to fail a little bit, the mitral valve leaks more, the heart continues to fail, and it keeps on going until unfortunately you develop a significant heart failure. That presents with the same kind of symptoms, and that is you feel short of breath. Um, you can't lay down flat at night. You may incre have an increase in the amount of fluid that you notice is accumulating on your body. Um, and those are signs that you s should see a doctor right away. There may be a problem with your heart or one of the valves in your heart. 
So what we know is that mitral valve regurgitation or leaking of the mitral valve is, is not very well treated. It's under-recognized. There are probably 4.1 million patients with mitral valve disease um, in the United States, unfortunately, and that's around the 2009-2010 time period. Um, probably about a third of those or a few, little more than a third of those are eligible for treatment. But the number of patients who are undergoing mitral valve surgery is incredibly small. It's 1%. 1% to 2% of those who are eligible for surgery. So it's not well recognized and it's not fully treated. And let me describe to you some of the treatments we can use. So first, we want to make sure we optimize medications because medications can help patients with mitral valve problems because we reduce the amount of fluid on the body, we reduce the pressure in the heart, and that can help the heart function better and the mitral valve function a little bit better. But eventually, there's only a limit to how much my medications can do. So we move on to several things. The most effective thing for mitral valve leaking or mitral valve regurgitation is open heart surgery. Uh, so you can basically, as I said, open, heart, open the chest, open the heart, um, and repair or replace the mitral valve using sutures or a new valve. There are new, uh, newer, more, uh, less invasive, I should say, robotic surgeries or minimally invasive surgeries, which means you don't do the full cut or sternotomy down the center of the chest. Sometimes you can go through the side of the chest or a small incision at the upper part of the chest and replace the valve that way. And that tends to be a little bit less invasive. Um, and finally, for patients who are not good candidates for surgery or are high risk for surgery, we do have a percutaneous or catheter-based option, and that's called the mitra clip. So obviously, the least invasive thing is to use those medications to optimize the function of the heart, reduce the mitral regurgitation. That only works for so long. Um, the most invasive is mitral valve surgery, where you do open heart surgery, cut open the heart, replace or repair the valve. And kind of in the middle, for those patients that are high risk, um, is the mitral clip, where you're able to go through the vein in the leg, again, putting the catheter up the major vessel and into the heart, and then using a clip to clip together the two valve leaflets uh, and reduce the leaking in the valve. So this is the uh, first in class and the, the best possible um, transcatheter option that we have right now. We are testing other transcatheter options, and ANOVA, thankfully, is not only a, a center where we do a lot of treatments for valvular heart disease percutaneously and otherwise, but we're also a center for research. So we have several research uh, studies and trials that allow patients that might not otherwise be candidates for these therapies to access them through our research trials. And that, that like our oncology colleagues, you know, usually provides patients with opportunities they might not have if they were going to a smaller or another type of medical center. So, you know, that's one of the things we're very proud of at ANOVA. We can offer our patients almost anything that's available uh, out there in the medical world. So what we know about the mitra clip is it consistently reduces the amount of leaking in the valve. It helps patients feel a lot better, so their heart failure gets better. They have less shortness of breath. They're able to walk more and do more activity. Um, what we know is it reduces the likelihood that you're hospitalized again for heart failure or this problem. Um, the mitra clip right now, unlike transcatheter valve replacement, which helps you feel better and helps you live longer, the mitra clip doesn't help you live longer. It just helps you feel better. And so for those patients who can have surgery, that's probably the better option because that helps you live longer and feel better. But for patients who can't have surgery, the mitral clip's a great option because it's going to help you feel a lot better. Good things about, again, the mitral clip as compared with open heart surgery. The length of stay is usually between one and two days. Um, you're able to get out of the hospital. Nearly 90% of patients with a mitral clip have really good results with uh, reduced mitral regurgitation and feeling a lot better. Uh, and again, it reduces the likelihood you'll be hospitalized by nearly 75%. So that talks about the most prevalent heart valve diseases that we're able to treat. And right now we're able to treat them with transcatheter techniques that avoid open heart surgery. Um, so I'm going to move on to something that's even more common in our elderly population, but it's not heart valve disease. Um, and it's, it's atrial fibrillation. And I know lots of people have an experience, either themselves or a family member who has atrial fibrillation. Um, so you'll see all sorts of doctors when you have atrial fibrillation. And that, to define it, it's an abnormal rhythm of the heart, the top chambers of the heart, in which those top chambers beat 
kind of chaotically. They are no longer organized. And while some people can feel that and they feel worse, they can feel like their heart is irregular, they can feel fatigued, they can feel less able to do exercise, some patients don't feel any of that. They don't feel any different. But the problem with atrial fibrillation is it increases your stroke risk. So if you have atrial fibrillation, um, the likelihood that you have stroke is five to 10 times higher than the rest of the population. And that's a problem. Strokes are very, very bad things. So about 15 to 20 percent of all strokes in the United States are in fact related to atrial fibrillation. Um, and what we see in research is that a stroke from atrial fibrillation is often more debilitating than other types of strokes. And um, it's associated with high morbidity, that is high, high likelihood of problems inside and outside the hospital, and high mortality. And what we think is that um, the strokes from atrial fibrillation are coming from a small part of the heart called the left atrial appendage. That blood pools in that small little chamber in the heart and then forms clots. And then when the heart is, uh, the bottom chamber is pumping, it can pump those clots, unfortunately, to your brain, and that causes a stroke. Right now, the best therapy that we can give for that problem is oral anticoagulation or blood thinners. So uh, many of you might be familiar with a, a drug called warfarin or Coumadin. That's the oldest and most reliable blood thinner, but it requires that you go um, either to the doctor's office or a lab and get your blood checked every month. Nowadays, thankfully, we do have point of care monitors where you can do that at home and check check that level at home, but you still have to send it to a doctor. And then you have to monitor the dose, and sometimes that involves taking different doses every day or changing your dose every month, um, so it can be a big pain. Uh, we also have other therapies now, something called novel oral anticoagulants. Those are an amazing uh, step for medicine because you can take those medications in a fixed dose, and you don't have to change any of the doses on a monthly basis. You don't have to get it checked. We know that those medications prevent stroke consistently, and they don't, you don't need to check the levels of the medications. They're, they just work, and they work well um, for a lot of patients. But I will say there's a certain percentage of patients um, where oral anticoagulation or the blood thinners aren't good for them, for them. If they have bleeding problems, if they have bleeding in your GI tract, that is your stomach or your intestines, Oral anticoagulants, blood thinners, don't work very well for you because they increase the likelihood that you have bleeding. If you've had a fall or you have bleeding in your brain, obviously blood thinners aren't great for you either because you don't want to have another a bleeding problem in, in your brain. And something that's maybe common on the West Coast and common in this area, if your job requires that, you're, that you are exposed to trauma, and that is policemen, firemen, active duty military, then those patients may not want to be on blood thinners either because they're at increased risk to have a major problem if they have trauma and end up having a, a bleeding issue. So there's a good number of patients out there who maybe aren't a great candidate for oral anticoagulation. What we need is another therapy. And so thankfully, we do have another therapy. Um, and that is something called the Watchman device, or left atrial appendage closure. So this device actually reduces the risk of stroke by closing off the left atrial appendage, this little tiny chamber in the heart where clots can form and cause stroke. So I'm going to show you um, a little video about that as well, if I can do this effectively. Let's see. I cannot see my clicker. There it is. Oh, there we go. This, uh, this device is made by the Boston Scientific Company. It is implanted again through the vein in the leg. We go through that vein and we put the device up through the heart and we'll kind of walk through this. It's, it's like a little umbrella, um, metal with fabric coating. And again, this is a schematic of a patient uh, draped and just that the vein in the leg exposed and we put the catheter through that vein, up the main vein that goes to the heart, and then we actually go through the right heart chamber into the left heart chamber. So this is that little pouch, the left atrial appendage. It's where the clots can form and cause strokes.
And what we do is we actually cross from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart with our catheter. And we access into that small little chamber, that left atrial appendage, uh, where a lot of those clots form. Then we kind of maneuver our way with this catheter. It's called a pigtail catheter because it looks like a pig's tail. Um, and we maneuver that into the left atrial appendage. And uh, old doctors back in the 1800s called everything, they related everything to food. So there's um, broccoli, chicken wing, et cetera. That's very, very common in medicine uh, that we relate it to food. Um, but we put the catheter into the left atrial appendage. We measure the distance into the left atrial appendage appropriately. That also means that we measure and put the right size device into the left atrial appendage. And it's a fairly simple process. We take pictures to make sure we're in the right place. We take pictures to make sure we have the right measurements. Once we're very, very confident, we select the right size device. And we place that in through the catheter. No pacing or anything else that's necessary in the body. We release the device. It expands on its own into uh, the left atrial appendage. We make sure that it's going to stay there. We obviously don't want it to fall out. Uh, we measure it in multiple ways. We look at it with uh, contrast eye. We look at it with transesophageal echocardiogram. Once we feel good that it's in the right place, it's not going to go anywhere, we release it, take it off the wire, um, and we leave it there. And what happens over the next three months is that uh, your own body's cells grow over the device, and they close off the atrial appendage completely. And what we found in studies of thousands and thousands of patients is that the Watchman device is just as good as warfarin in preventing strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. It has not been compared to those newer medications, um, but in patients that can't um, take oral anticoagulation, this is the best possible therapy for them. So I want to take a second, and we're kind of lucky. We have multiple patients here uh, in the audience who have had some of these therapies. And so I wanted to ask if anybody wanted to um, discuss. One of my patients is here, Mr. Elliott, who had two of these therapies, who actually had transcatheter valve replacement and the Watchman therapy. And I just wanted to say thank you to him being here, um, but also to say, did you want to say anything about your experience with these therapies? And um, hopefully not too many warnings but maybe uh, just information for other patients. And that's an important point, you know, thank you for saying that. The valve replacement makes you feel better, usually right away, usually within a couple of weeks, and you feel less short of breath. You feel like you can do more exercise. You feel like you can do a lot. But the Watchman, have you noticed any difference in how you feel after a Watchman? Absolutely not. Right. The Watchman doesn't help you feel any different, and that's an important point. The Watchman protects you from stroke. It's kind of like that silent guardian for you, but it won't make you feel any different. So I try to tell my patients, hopefully we talked about it several times before the case, et cetera, but you're not going to feel any different. But the most important thing will be within six weeks when we can take you off that blood thinner, then you'll feel better because you'll be less at risk for bleeding. Um, and hopefully we're going to find out with Mr. Elliott in the next <laughs> month or so, and hopefully we can take you off that blood thinner in the next month. Well, it, uh, I woke up and, and uh, felt alert and... Everything was pretty good. Yeah. It's, they're pretty nice procedures. Both procedures are done with anesthesia. The transcatheter valve replacement, of all things, is done with very little anesthesia. It's done with just Versed and fentanyl and some propofol, just mild anesthesia. The Watchman is done under full general anesthesia because we need a lot of imaging to make sure we're placing that in the correct place. But in both cases, um, for example, after the TAVR, usually patients go home within two to three days. I think after the Watchman, um, usually people go home within one day. And I think that was your experience, wasn't it? Yeah. So you go home the next day. You stay overnight just for observation, and then you go home the next day. And so that's, it's pretty unique that we can do these catheter-based therapies and get patients home within one to three days. 
We better use anesthesia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's good to use anesthesia because, you know, the areas that we go in the groin through the vein and the, the blood vessel, they can be painful if we don't use anesthesia and local anesthetic. Another one of my patients is here who had a transcatheteric valve replacement. Um, I apologize, I forget everybody's name, but um, do you want to talk about, at all about your experience? How did you feel after the transcatheteric valve replacement? They took me off my, uh, uh, what's that word? Eloquist. And uh, I was two days in, in, well, a day and a half, and uh, I had the stroke, and I didn't think I was going to make it. But uh, I came to Fairfax Hospital, and uh, the team took over, and I had the aortic valve replaced, and I was out in two days. But uh, I had to, to do, uh, uh, to make sure I was eligible for it, I had like a waiting period where I had to wait, and I had to go back and get re-examined and that, and uh, they finally came through. And uh, it really surprised me. Uh, I'm still a little tired, but maybe I'm candidate for something else now. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, I'm good. Well, thank you for sharing your experience, and thank you for coming. That's very nice of you. I, have, I still worry about him getting um, the blood clots and stuff. Yeah. Uh, he, if he goes into the hospital for anything and they take him off the aliquist, they have to put him on a heparin drip That's right. right away. That's right. And so this other thing that you were just talking about, um, I don't know. That sounds like a great thing if that could get him off. Of, he, he was a firefighter 36 years at Fairfax County. And uh, so he knows the ins and outs for trauma for, yeah. for firefighters. And, uh, but he has tremors, too. So, you know, Fairfax Hospital, to me, and especially the Heart uh, Center, has done so much for him. It's really it's touched me. And I, I don't want to go anywhere else but here. Uh, so, but it's, I've seen a big difference in him since he had the tariff done. It's just so, it's, it's like day and night. And then when he had the stroke, I mean, I was like devastated. But the next day, it was like, he, it was like he'd been brought right back to me the way he was. We've been together 52 years and I don't want to ever see him like that again. So. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Doctor, for well, your team. Again, thank you for sharing your experience. We have a wonderful team, honestly. And, it's, and um, the doctors get to do the fun part. We get to do the, uh, the procedures in the end and, and see the patients before and after. But we have a team of nurses, nurse practitioners, schedulers, coordinators, people who you meet a lot. And they actually take care of you all the way through the process. And often you become even more attached with them than with us. Um, and so you know, really need to thank and recognize all of those people who make the procedures possible. But, um, but it's a tremendous privilege to get to do this, and I, I am incredibly grateful for some of the patients that come to these events um, to, to say, yeah, exactly, we, we do send you postcards, um, and who, who can give the experience, because I think patients hear better when it's another patient telling you um, that the procedure works and they feel a lot better. Any questions uh, from people in the audience? Go ahead. Um, when you in the last procedure, I believe did the mitral check. The uh, mitral clip, that's right. Yeah. When you block it off using that device, why do cells go over that device? Because ah. so there was the in watchman, there a hole yeah. before, too. Yeah. So for the watchman, you're right. So anything that you place in the body, mm -hmm. your body cells want to grow over it. Okay. It's a foreign material, but your body cells end up growing over it because it wants to incorporate it into the body. In some cases, that might mean, you know, for transplant patients, et cetera, sometimes the cells reject the new thing that's in the body. But right. thankfully, these are engineered so that they're inert. So okay. the metals and the fabrics that these are made of, 
react very well with the body, and that is the body grows over it and accepts it into the body. So the reason the body grows over it is to make it part of it and so that uh, it will become part of the body and not cause any major problems in the future. Um, but that's very, very common. It happens with almost anything we implant in the body. The body uh, tissue and cells grow over it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Those procedures are, are uh, aren't the same as the ablation type procedures. Ah, that's a great question. Um, the ablation type procedures are for patients with atrial fibrillation who want to basically get rid of the arrhythmia overall. And so the ablation itself can help some people feel better. So unlike the watchman, which takes away the stroke risk, but you don't feel any different, the ablation can take away the atrial fibrillation and help you feel better. The problem with ablation is that we don't know as much about it. We don't understand it as well as we understand some of these valvular heart problems. So it works in about 65 to 70 percent of the time. And often patients require more than one ablation to make it work. So, so the, it can work and it can help you feel a lot better, um, but it's not foolproof. And so the treatments for the valves, uh, the TAVR, for example, example is 99% effective. It always works. Let's go. Um, he had three of the operations. Yeah. For, and, not uncommon to hear that and, from and patients. Yeah. Being a firefighter, I mean, he had three of them. But the thing was is now it's back again. Right. So. I just, when I seen that, I was like, well, here we go. Maybe this yeah. might be the thing we need to do. Yeah. So, so again, the, the watchman is nice because it reduces your risk of stroke, but it won't change how much atrial fibrillation you have. But the ablations can, but that same story is probably told by 30 to 40 percent of people. Oh, I've had multiple ablations. Doesn't always work. Um, over half of people, it does work. So I, I, I don't want to you know, bad mouth ablations because there are lots of patients that get a lot of benefit from them. Yes, sir. Are there any other approaches? To atrial fibrillation? Great question. So there are general approaches to atrial fibrillation. No matter what, you should go on either a blood thinner to reduce your risk of stroke or you should receive a Watchman device or something like that to reduce your risk of stroke. So that is the standard. Now, to reduce the amount of atrial fibrillation, there are several different techniques. The first one, which is as effective as anything, is you just reduce the heart rate. So you put you on medications that keep your heart from going fast, because some patients have problems when their hearts go fast. That is a very simple technique. It's probably the easiest. But for patients that feel a lot of symptoms from atrial fibrillation, if you feel palpitations or fatigue or those other things, it's, it's not that effective. The next step is to take antiarrhythmic drugs or advanced type of drugs that attempt to keep your heart in normal sinus rhythm. Those often require you come into the hospital for several days. Um, and those are about, at best, 30 to 40 percent effective. So for some patients, they work very, very well. But probably less than half of patients are able to stay out of atrial fibrillation with just those medications. And the final step is the ablation pathway, and that is having one, two, three ablations to try to get rid of the arrhythmia. Now, I will tell you, these are used in combination. So typically, if you have an atrial fibrillation ablation, you also receive those antiarrhythmic medications as well. But those are our current therapies. And trust me, atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia, but it's also one of the most researched arrhythmias in the world because we're trying to figure out how to prevent it, how to stop it, how to make people feel better. Um, and unfortunately, it's just not as well understood as some other things like valve disease. So for, for some patients, you can receive a pacemaker. And in the most extreme case, what they do is they burn an area in your heart called the atrial ventricular node. And then they give you a pacemaker. And then you can never have the problems of atrial fibrillation again because they've blocked the conduction in the heart that causes that problem. Uh, and then your pacemaker, you're always in need of a pacemaker. Um, but that's a, very, that's a very extreme tactic to reduce uh, atrial fibrillation. Can work in some patients. Somebody over there. I'm sorry. Yep, go ahead. Well, you had mentioned that some of these can uh, 
Sorry. Some of the some of the diseases, uh, some of the issues can come up. If you've had childhood cancer, how does adult cancer treatment or chemo impact decisions on how you treat? And that's a really good question. So childhood cancer, I mentioned because often for childhood cancer, at least um, in the era 20 to 30 years ago, how they treated childhood cancers was they gave radiation. And it's very effective, but what they didn't know at that time is that 20 to 30 years later, the problems that come from radiation, are, it affects the tissues of the heart. And so you can have heart valve problems, vessel problems, uh, function of the heart problems. And so, so that's what I meant in that case. In adult cancer, some adult cancers are also treated with radiation. So the most common one that I talk to patients about is breast cancer. If you have left-sided breast cancer, you may receive radiation. What they do is they do stereotactic radiation. They try to aim the radiation beams at exactly the right place, but some of that still affects the heart. Um, and so the radiation-induced heart disease is far less in patients who just have stereotactic radiation for breast cancer, but still present. Chemotherapy affects the heart in a different way. And typically, regimens of chemotherapy can cause the heart muscle itself to dilate and weaken. In that case, it can be treated with medications. Um, but what we do now and what oncologists do, and they work with cardiologists, there's a whole field called cardio-oncology where cardiologists and oncologists honestly work together to monitor the heart, to reduce the doses of cardiotoxic um, chemotherapy, and to be very, very careful. And so now we're just much more aware of what goes on so we can minimize the damage to the heart, but it's still present, it's still out there, and what people do is they follow it very closely and, and we give medications to try to prevent that damage. Yes, sir. Typically when you have these things done, do you come off medication or do you stay on medication? This is, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I will speak to it briefly only because I'm not an electrophysiologist, but I am a cardiologist. Um, Dr. Wish is one of the cardiologists who, he gave a very nice uh, presentation on atrial fibrillation a couple months ago. Um, and so for ablation, for some patients, they can come off of antiarrhythmic therapy, the medications that prevent the atrial fibrillation. For very few patients, they can come off of the blood thinners. Very few patients, most patients, stay on the blood thinners. And some patients stay on the antiarrhythmic drugs as well. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, I have some very good electrophysiology friends who I trained with. Um, and it's kind of likened to this. Imagine that you have atrial fibrillation and you go into it five to six times a year and at least a few of those times it requires that you go to the hospital and you either receive medical therapy or even a, a electric shock to get out of atrial fibrillation. Those kind of things can happen, very common with atrial fibrillation. So if I told you that an ablation could reduce that down to one time a year, would you be willing to do that? And most people say yes, because even though it's not fail safe, it doesn't work 100% of the time, it is effective in reducing the amount of atrial fibrillation you have and possibly reducing the number of times you have to seek medical care for it. So it's not a perfect therapy. So for transcatheter valve replacement, you replace the valve, you stop having to go to the hospital for many, many years and your heart starts working better. And there are lots of things that get better. And so it's, it's a very, very definitive therapy. Atrial fibrillation ablation is not as definitive. Good question. So for atrial fibrillation, the risk, um, there's a small risk of stroke because you are doing work in the top chamber of the heart. And so while you're doing that, there's a risk of stroke. Um, there's a risk of bleeding from the area that they go in in the leg, risk of bleeding for all of these procedures from that artery or vein that you go in. Um, the other risks are pretty small. There's a small risk of causing a small perforation in the heart and then causing blood to accumulate around the heart. That's typically treated with just a catheter to drain that blood, but, but those are risks um, that are part of the procedure. Uh, overall, it's a very safe procedure. You know, hundreds of those procedures are done in our hospital uh, per year. Well, if we're all set, if, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to stay after and answer questions that maybe are not 
you know, uh, appetizing to ask in a big group of people. Um, but I want to thank everyone for coming out and please let us know if there's any ways that we could do better or other topics that you'd like to hear about. So thank you very much, everyone.